Hi, I'm Sherry Lynn Horhoda. I am a classical flutist in pursuit of jazz improvisation, and this is Musicality Now. This is Pathways, where we share the stories of real music learners just like you, who are each on their own path of developing their musicality and discovering their true potential as musicians. Hi, my name is Christopher. I'm the founder and director of Musical U, and welcome to Musicality Now. Today I'm excited to share another Pathways story with you, this time from Musical U member Sherilyn Hohota, who was successfully headed towards becoming a professional flute player before making a career change into engineering, having three kids, and now in the last couple of years has returned to the flute in a somewhat surprising way. Sherilyn makes fantastic use of the progress journal system inside Musical U for sharing how she's getting on, so I had some sense of her interesting backstory and all the cool activities she's been up to. But as you'll be hearing, Musical U is just one part of all the resources she's been drawing on and all the ways she's been stretching herself since returning to flute. In this conversation, we talk about how studying Alexander Technique in Finland let her feel much freer in her playing and opened up her sound on flute. We talk about the specific resources and exercises that have helped Sherilyn start to improvise, and in a way that feels like she's truly expressing herself, rather than just improv by numbers following chord tones. And we talk about the two clever variants on traditional exercises, scales and long notes, which she now gives her flute students to help them improve faster and enjoy practicing more. So part of the intention with this Pathways series is to share stories of music learners who are perhaps more relatable than all the world-leading experts that we're so fortunate to have the chance to interview here on the show. But I'm not sure Sherilyn quite fits that bill, because as you'll discover, she is one seriously impressive music learner. I'm sure that you will find a lot to relate to in her story though, and pick up some handy ideas and pointers that you can apply in your own musical journey. My name's Christopher Sutton, and this is Musicality Now from Musical U. Welcome to the show, Shari Lynn. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I have been so looking forward to this because you're one of our most active members of the Musical U community, and I've been kind of watching your journey from afar and found it so fascinating and inspiring. And I'm really excited to have the chance now to share that with the Musicality Now audience. You have a really interesting backstory in that you began in a very classical direction in a very serious way, and that's not quite where you've ended up today. So I'd love if we could begin with that early backstory and how you got into playing flute in the first place. Okay, so the backstory is typical for um, kids pursuing music. Started in the uh, sixth grade band, um, I wanted to play clarinet. And so I listened to everything that had clarinet in it. And when I showed up to uh, band class, he said, you're playing flute, I have too many clarinets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. I'm playing flute and uh, went through the, the typical um, high school band. I, 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 I excelled at it. Um, I practiced a lot. And, and I, I, I know we, have, we, have the, we always have the talk about talent. Um, I learned quickly. So and, and then if I got something, I just went for it more and more and, and continued to practice. So we had high school band director or our high school band director was phenomenal. He was one of those special band directors and he was truly my inspiration for staying in music. I have a number of friends that, that I still have contact with from my high school that are also still in music. So he was truly an inspiration. Band directors really have a bigger influence than I think anyone even imagines. Um, they see these children, especially the high school band, high school band directors see these children for four years and they see them grow a lot of growth happens over those four years. I have a couple high schoolers, so I, I see it. And he has to deal with it again and again. <laughs> I'm happy mine have grown. Um, but I, I was very inspired by him and uh, didn't know what I want to be when I grew up. My mom wanted me, wanted me to be a travel agent and um, I, was, I was a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I wanted to be anything my mom wanted me to be. <laughs> Um, but uh, I loved music and um, I needed money for college, so won a music scholarship, so there you go. I, I, I went into music and um, the local community college had a very gifted flute teacher and um, I had the blessing of going there and she was phenomenal and she was very connected in the flute community. So um, went there for two years and she was the one that introduced me to my teacher in um, Hartford, Connecticut, who's at the Hart School of Music. 
His name is John Wyan. He's the principal of the New York City Opera. So I transferred there and uh, you have to send an audition tape and all of that and I got in. But my, my background was nothing like these kids I went to school with. I started flute lessons as a sophomore in high school. Most of them had, had lessons through, throughout uh, middle school and high school. Um, so I was behind. And, um, but um, she was such a great foundation. My initial teacher, Darlene Dugan, was such a great foundation at that junior college level that I was ready for it. And then when I got to Hart, um, I ended up doing fine. I was principal of the wind ensemble. And he told me, he said, I'm not gonna put you in the orchestra because you're a strong player. I want you as principal player. So that's, that's what I got to do. And my conductor was the father of one of the top flute players there. And uh, so the extra pressure was there to do well when I had a solo. And he was a very intense man. Um, so the look he gave me when he would bring me in for my solos was <laughs> so high, highly intense. And um, I just love him. He's just a great musician and met many great musicians while at heart. Um, but what happened with me, I, I worked with some of the best. I, uh, two of my chamber music coaches um, were, uh, one was a chamber music player um, throughout New York, Frank Borelli. I've, I've seen him somewhere in podcast land interviewed, so he's still out there playing. Um, the other was Bert Lucarelli, who um, I attended one of his recitals at Carnegie Hall. So going from small town to this was a big deal. Um, They're great people. Um, I had the opportunity to have master classes with Julius Baker, who my first teacher um, knew <laughs> well. <laughs> she knew him well, and, and um, she was the one that got me going to his master classes in the summer. And he's a legend. He's absolutely a legend. And um, he did me this huge favor. Um, I played for him at one of his master classes, and um, you have the opportunity to either play once or play three times. And I think that particular time, <clears throat> I played for him three times. And on the first time I played, he looks at me and he goes, you're nervous, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, yes. And we were in this beautiful church and he looks out the back door, which was open and he said, oh, look, I think I see a squirrel out there. It, it, it's like the movie Up, squirrel. Everybody got up. Everybody got up and looked because he said to do that. And he said, do you feel better now? And I said, yes. <laughs> well, come to find out my teacher says, uh, he does not do that for everybody. A lot of the people, he would just let them play and not say anything. But he, uh, he let me play and he proceeded to rip me apart. <laughs> he showed me where my weaknesses were. And then I went to work. And, and I just, for the next two days, I had two days in between, it was a week long master class, I shedded. I just shedded, practiced my butt off. And when I came back and played for him again, he just sat back, folded his arms, and he nodded at me. I'm like, oh, what a gift. So uh, love that man, love his playing. Um, what, what a, I, now that he's, he's gone, um, I realized what a huge blessing that was when it was going on. You know, you have no idea. You're in high school, college, everything's good. So. Um, I went from that into um, what my work at Heart, and I got some gig opportunities there where we go out and play for parties and things like that. Um, but I remember talking to my teacher and I said, you know, this is all really great and I like playing and stuff. I said, but something's missing. And he said, well, what do you think it is? And I said, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I have no idea what, what it is. And he says, you know, I got an idea. Let me send you up to Brannon Flutes which is a custom flute maker in Boston. And he goes, I got some connections up there. Why don't you go spend the day with them and, and see what they're up to? So I spent the day with them. They were great. Let me take a flute apart completely. I loved it. So um, that was my first introduction to that. Um, nothing went on after that. And I think it was just a little planting of the seed. Um, after I graduated from Hart, um, I wanted to continue to study because I didn't feel like I was ready. Um, I had some opportunities um, to play with the Norwalk Symphony Orchestra um, while I was getting ready to go to Finland. I spent a year working so I could raise the money. And I chose, I met a teacher um, 
on the summer be prior to graduating that was from Phil, and that's how I ended up there and loved her playing. She used Alexander technique along with her playing. And um, I think my teacher was very well aware of the tension <laughs> that I had in my playing. I just wanted to do it so badly, I guess. Um, and so he said, I think this lady's perfect for you. And so he sent me to her master class. And I think what impressed me the most was everything she played gave me goosebumps. She's, she's so, oh, such a musical player. And that was kind of, um, I guess my vibe is that um, if I was gonna do anything, I wanted to move people with what I play. I didn't want to sit there and listen to them flap their fingers around or I, I wanted them to, to feel something. Either I'm communicating what the composer had asked of me or um, within an ensemble that we all band together and play together. Um, I, I wanted that. I wanted what she, I wanted what she did. So um, I ended up um, putting the money together to go to Finland um, for a year. And um, then I ended up getting a scholarship. So I was able to go for two years. And I wonder if I might interject there, because you mentioned something in passing, which was Alexander technique and how it relates to tension. If someone watching or listening isn't familiar with that, could you explain what that was and why it was relevant to this? Yeah, Alexander technique is, is um, basically a study in how to use yourself properly. So, so you're, you're getting into how the body should naturally function. Um, uh, Alexander, I believe it's Matthias Alexander is his first name. He was a, um, an actor on stage and he had a situation in which he got up on stage, went to say something and nothing came out. And so horrifying for anybody. And he went to town to see, well, what is this about? And he began to research that and he came up with this technique what he first discovered was that the connection between the head and the neck, so it's right if you nod your head, that portion right there, that connection has to be free. And if you think of anything about the brain, our brain has to communicate to the rest of the body. So he, he said, or what he discovered then was this, if this connection is free, then we are able to freely do what the brain is asking for the rest of the body. There's nothing in the way. So in my, I took Alexander Technique lessons while in Finland, and I spent a lot of time, actually the initial lessons, they, they teach you how to stand and how to sit. <laughs> Seriously. Um, Alexander Technique is about giving yourself direction. So you give yourself direction that you lead with the head, the head goes forward and up. If I had room to stand, I would stand, um, but you have, to, you have to stand forward or you have to lean you're not leaning, but you're giving yourself this um, direction that your head is going to go forward and up as you stand. So you're not putting pressure down as you lift yourself or anything like that. And then on the sitting part, he would get behind my knees and kind of just remind me knees forward and away so that your knees just go down. So you're not trying to make anything happen. Your body will naturally want to do these things. After a lot of that, then they get you on the table and they start working on your shoulders. And they're trying just to release that tension as he's working with me, maybe pulling arms, almost like a chiropractor may, may do if they're working your ligaments. Um, as he would work on me, he himself was releasing tension. So it has a little bit to do with energy. And um, I, I have pictures of myself um, after having that Alexander technique and my shoulders are probably about this much lower <laughs> because we keep so much tension in our shoulders, so much tension in our neck. And as a flute player, it comes out here, you know, and so you're doing some funny things with your neck, trying to get that flute where it needs to go. So um, I have continued to practice that. Um, it was incorporated in my lessons really early on. She did not use Alexander technique, but it was always about how you use yourself. Um, getting out of your own way it was, with her, was her motto to me most of the time. So the Alexander technique was huge for me. Um, it's a, and, and I, I think, um, just the sense of, it's a mindfulness about your body. If, mm. if, if that gives, gives the right, um, context for it. So, um, the, I would, I would have to say, um, the Alexander technique is still around. Um, I know someone just up the road from us about 35 miles is, is an Alexander teacher. So it is still out there. It's still around. Um, primarily it was in New York at the time. 
Um, I don't know how I got this guy in Finland, in Helsinki, um, but he, he studied in New York. So it's something that you have to go to a centralized location to study. And um, they've got something close to that out there now, and I don't know if you've run across it. It's called body mapping. You haven't run across it. It's a similar type thing where they're looking at the, the true anatomy of the body, the true physiology of the body, and incorporating that into the instrument you're playing or how you're using yourself as you play. And I know um, that's pretty much what um, my teacher had taught me, um, Darlene Dugan from um, my first teacher that I had in a junior college. <laughs> I talked to her about that and she was kind of cynical and she said, yeah, I've been teaching that for years. <laughs> <laughs> so, lover. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's basically, um, and I see it all the time in, in kids, this bad posture and, and bad hand positions and, and all of that. And Alexander technique made me sensitive to, to that. And that sometimes I can feel it in myself that I'm literally uncomfortable as I watch and listen to this person play. Mm. And my teacher in Finland could literally say, release your ankles. And that note would pop out. I'm like, really? Release my ankles and that works. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. But it, 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 she just was that good. And it's, it's that sensitivity you get from practicing it for so long. She was, she was quite good at it. She didn't even need a massage ever. <laughs> she could, Fascinating. Because you, Alexander Technique, you're talking to yourself saying, release your shoulders, release your neck. Um, it, it, it's weird, but um, mm -hmm. it works. There's just so many things that we do where we talk to ourselves and it does work. So it's not that far out there, but go ahead. So it sounds like that was of great help to you. Was that part of the secret behind why this teacher could play as movingly as she could, so musically, or was this unrelated and just a side perk of going to study with her? No, I, I, I bet she was very much like me, that she needed it. Mm. It'd be my guess. Um, when you're a very sensitive person, like I'll cry at a commercial, um, you're sensitive to everything. So um, if somebody's next to you and they're glaring at you because you got the chair in front of them, I feel that and I feel it very strongly. And Alexander Technique is one thing you can use to help through that. Interesting. And so how did those studies in Finland go? How did it develop you as a flute player? Oh, goodness. It, it just it opened up my sound like crazy. I, I had a good sound coming in. A lot of flute playing is about your sound, um, but it really opened up my sound. Um, it made me feel more confident in my technique, the, the playing fast that we have to do as flute players. Um, it, it just really opened up all of that for me. And it, it opened up my expression um, where I could take on certain pieces and really allow myself to let go more than I could before. And did it kind of scratch that itch or fill that gap for you? You said that you you heard this teacher play and she was able to put such emotion into it and make it so moving. Did you start to feel like you were able to do that same thing? Yeah, I think I was getting there, definitely. And, and um, some of the things I got to do while I was there um, were... were, were um, extra special for me. I didn't do a lot of orchestral work um, outside of um, the symphony I played in um, before I left for Finland. Um, in, in school, there just wasn't an opportunity. But when I got there, there was like a conductor's orchestra. And there I had the opportunity to um, play Sibelius, to play uh, Finnish composer's music in Finland. And um, that just, and then I got to see what he saw when he wrote some of his music. And you know, coming coming from the, the lessons I had with her, her approach, incorporating the Alexander technique, and then having that constant um, <clears throat> experience to go through the repertoire. Yeah, I, I felt like a player. Fantastic. Well, I feel like so far, this could be the beginning of an interview with a world leading professional flautist. And that's not actually how your story continued. No. So <laughs> what happened next? But, well, I came back from Finland and uh, I was 25 and I'm like, okay, now what? I have to make money. And uh, I think at that time, my story probably would be different if I had a mentor. I didn't know what to do. My parents weren't musical. They thought I was nuts trying to do this. Um, I just didn't know what to do. So I took the GRE, got everything ready to work on um, a master's degree. At, and so I was going to go to University of North Carolina. 
and you know, life gets busy. Um, I don't know why I turned that opportunity down, but I did. <laughs> he wanted, you know, when, when you perform for a teacher and they want you to study with them, they do want you to study with them. And I don't know if it was money, <laughs> we really don't know. But I didn't end up doing that. I went to um, the college that was in my parents' town um, or in my parents' state, because you have to have that residency. And I ended up going back into music education. So instead of getting um, a master's degree, I guess I was going to finish a bachelor's. I had my bachelor's in performance, but I didn't have it in music. So I went there, <clears throat> and I'd have to say, the first semester I was there, um, great, great orchestral experiences. Um, funny story, can I take an aside? Because it's just too, too weird. Um, I played in the orchestra, and uh, we had a soloist coming, a violinist, <clears throat> playing a violin concerto with us. And then there was a gentleman that came in to rehearse the orchestra where, you know, the real guy comes later. And that guy knew me. <laughs> he was from the Norwalk Symphony. He was the concert master. That was nuts. Norwalk is in Connecticut. I was at school in South Carolina and he looks in the orchestra and he goes, <laughs> so that was just too weird. That was, that was really super fun. Um, but yeah, the, uh, I, I got into, I, I enjoyed the orchestral experience there, but, um, Something was missing, and so I took this this class because um, I had most of my my jet, my education stuff done. All I needed was some music ed classes, and I took physics in the arts. And physics in the arts is basically a really watered down version of physics, um, and anything in any way it would apply to art. So there's a lot of um, wave theory watered down, whether it be sound waves or um, the, the the waves of of visual visual waves. Um, so I, I enjoyed that class. That class was great. And he required it at research paper. And for the research paper, I did architectural acoustics. It sounded cool. And uh, the author of the book um, was actually a consultant that practiced in Clemson. So Clemson is an hour away or something from uh, Columbia for where I was. So used his book and I was so impressed with what he had in the book and enjoyed the experience so much, I called him. <laughs> I called Good him on the you. phone. I'm like, hi, um, I used your book as a research paper and I am a classical musician and um, I'm kind of digging this, this acoustic, acoustic stuff. What's this all about? And he spoke to me for an hour and a half. And after the conclusion of that, um, I was on the way to become an engineer. He said, really, that's the quickest way to do it. You could do a master's in physics, but I didn't have a technical undergraduate degree, so that'd be kind of tough. And so uh, I switched my major to engineering. <laughs> I had, um, I did it, so I'm not like completely cold. I had high level math in high school. I had all the calculus classes and stuff like that. No, no pre-college ones, just, just regular high school classes, but, and I was good at it, so. Um, so I hadn't had math in six years, never took chemistry, never took physics, and I jumped right in, <laughs> which you've got technical experience. You know that was nuts. <laughs> a little bit crazy. Yeah. Could... <laughs> but I loved it, and, and um, I was really well taken care of. There was a, uh, one, one gentleman. Um, I must have talked to him. I, sometimes I forget how all this happened, but uh, one of the professors there uh, wanted to do an acoustics class. And he said, you need to take this class. I said, dude, I, I'm, I'm just struggling through calculus right now. Um, but he said, no, no, don't worry. You'll get an A. Don't worry about it. Just, just come. And he did some really great stuff. But um, he, some of the practical stuff was super cool. Like it was, it was before they made, um, I, I guess before they got into actual vocal, vocal things where you could give the information and then, then it would it would vocalize what you what you put in um so that was still early early technology and uh he did some projects in that but what blew me away is that he derived the wave equation <laughs> i didn't know what he was doing that was still so new to me so see, seeing second derivatives and all that craziness was 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 a little wild but uh i i spent a couple years in that um went to university of minnesota uh afterwards to specialize in acoustics and while I was at University of Minnesota, I got to do some uh, acoustical testing. So I worked for a company that we tested acoustical panels. And we would test them for absorption and transmission. 
So absorption are the typical panels that you'll see in a concert hall. Um, they absorb sound, so you have echoes going across the hall. And then there were transmission um, tests that we would do for certain materials that perhaps if you have a building that you're, you're making and you do not want to hear your neighbor next door, then you're going to get something with a high transmission coefficient, or excuse me, a low transmission coefficient. So we tested for that. And so I, I got involved with that and graduated um, from the University of Minnesota with a degree in mechanical engineering. Gotcha. And you're the kind of person that I'm sure we could do a whole hour, if not 10 hours, just on your engineering career. And it would be equally fascinating, but I'm going to try and I'm going to try and keep us on, try and keep us on the music. And so would it be fair to say your flute got put back in the box for a while? Were you able to keep that up at all alongside the career or was it just too hard to juggle? At University of Minnesota, I still had to work and I, I, I was working at 3M. Um, so I was pretty much working full time and taking um, engineering courses at night. I'd usually try to do two at a time. And so that's, that's pretty tough. So I, I really wasn't playing at all. Uh, I tried to do some work um, at the church there to play for mass, just to kind of keep my chops, but there wasn't time. So a lot of my skills went by the wayside, unfortunately. And if you don't mind me asking a, a slightly personal question, was that sad for you? Like you, you had had this identity around, I'm becoming a flute player. Was it a decision to be like, I'm putting that aside, I'm gonna do this engineering thing? Was it just kind of gradual and you didn't reflect on it too much? How, how were you thinking about the fact that you had been a flute player and now maybe weren't going to be? I think at the time I got so focused on doing the engineering thing, I was not sad. Um, but seeing my kids, which haven't made it into the picture yet, um, get into music, um, then it got sad. Gotcha. And you, I've seen you make comments, I think, in the musical you community about, I guess, having some doubt along the way, like before we got to that engineering fork in the road, as it were, you maybe weren't feeling 100% gung-ho about your future as a top-level professional flautist. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> there's a common far side uh, cartoon that shows an elephant sitting at a piano. And he says, what am I doing here? I'm a flutist. <laughs> <laughs> that, I kind of felt like that sometimes. Um, I think there were things that I struggled with. Um, I think there were times I got up to perform and I didn't want to be there. So I, I I'm learning why now, <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there were, there were a lot of times that I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what it was. I, it, actually, I know now what it was. It, it was, it had a lot to do with preparation and, and how I got to where I got to. Um, but yeah, there, in the orchestra, it wasn't so much that way, but the solo performance, I don't know. It was it was hard for me to stay focused, and sometimes I wanted to be somewhere else. Interesting. And I I don't want to short circuit our conversation, but looking back, can you shed shed some light on what was going on or what had factored into that? Why weren't you kind of fully stepping into that role? Would you say now? It really was preparation. Um, I started late getting those flute lessons, and so. Um, had I had them in, in, in high school, that would have helped. We played difficult music in high school. So I developed a lot of bad habits. And so instead of playing every note in the run so that you could hear every note, I faked it really well. <laughs> <laughs> I had something, uh, my, my teacher used to call it the Finnegan smear, which is my maiden name there. He goes, yeah, he goes, you got, we need to fix that. that. That is just not where you fix that. That has to be fixed in high school. When you're fixing it at a conservatory, you're behind. And so I knew that. And um, that is probably, um, it was a good thing because it has changed um, what I do now. It has changed how I approach everything I do now, my own practicing, my teaching, all of that. Cool. I, I've seen you say, I think in a previous conversation that back then you just didn't know how to practice. You knew to practice, but you didn't know how. And I definitely want to hear more about that and how you do it now and how you help your students to do it now. 
but I'm sure our listeners and viewers are going to be frustrated if I don't let you finish the story, as it were. So if we can give the kind of nutshell summary, you took this fork in the road towards engineering, and we know not to, like, spoiler alert, at some point you picked up your flute again. What happened in those intervening years? Uh, intervening years, uh, I came, um, I took a job in Florida and worked at that job for a short time and then did some work at, for a company that, uh, the Department of Defense company did that for a while and then ended up actually teaching AutoCAD. So which is a computer aided drafting program. And at that point I met my husband and a couple years later we had children and I am an all in kind of person that if I'm working, I'm all into working. And if I'm a mom, I'm all into a mom. So I went all in as a mom and quit my job. Loved my job, I absolutely loved empowering people. Um, in just two years, they would walk out of my classroom into a job. Um, but yeah, I wanted to be a mom. And so I have three children. One is in college, one is a junior in high school, and one is seven. <laughs> And um, it's my college student that brought me back into music. When he got to middle school, he was, he was quite talented. And I guess, you know, you have a musician mom, I'm going to make sure he gets what he needs. And that's where the, the hindsight's 2020 started to set in. Gee, if I had this, wonder what would have happened. Um, so I was very happy to provide that for him. He is, he is um, a very talented player and um, has excelled in just about every avenue. He plays saxophone and clarinet as well. And he's starting on the flute. And uh, my middle son plays the trumpet and he is doing quite well with um, his, his studies in addition. Uh, so he, I've got a trumpet player, saxophone player that doubles. Um, and both those guys are into jazz. And so my oldest one started playing gigs around town. So I, I wanna hear him play, so I go. And they all ask you, they talk to you, and they're like, hey, do you play? And like, yeah, I play flute, but I'm classical. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Bring your flute. Come on, just join us. It's not that easy, but they like to say it is. So um, what happened was one evening, one of the guys that knew me said, hey, I want you to check out my flute. I've got this Yamaha flute. Would you give it a look? And I said, I got it. I start playing a little bit and um, just noodle around a little bit. I'm like, oh, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. And I handed it back. And the next thing I know, the guy that was the leader of this big band that, that Matthew was um, going to play in invited me to play. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it was a piece by Bill Holman called Bill's Blues and the head or the beginning is played by the flute and um, it, it swung. So I have to use swing rhythm and all that. And I didn't really know how to do that at all. And um, it's a sight reading band. <laughs> So what I had and to do- were you a jazz fan <clears throat> up until this point? I Did love jazz. Oh, much jazz? Okay. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, when I was in high school, I, I wanted to play jazz desperately. Hubert Laws was out. He was super popular. Um, Herbie Mann was out. Uh, Paul Horn, I think, was the other one. And in college, I discovered um, Dave Valentine, who was a Latin jazz flutist. So I was all over these guys. I like this more than classical. I mean, it has always been in my blood. Yeah, and so I got led into this this jazz band, and um, since they're a sight reading band, there was no, I didn't know how I was going to sight read this. He did give me some music eventually, um, but what I decided to do was figure out by ear from the recording, because <laughs> I was scared to death. And was that something that had ever come up in your classical training, playing by ear? No, no, it had never come up. <clears throat> so, but so I, I I got to I got to play that, and it was I guess decent. He didn't fire me. Um, and then there was a 25 measure solo afterwards and, and I, someone was like, oh, play pentatonic scale, play ten pentatonic scale. I'm like, okay, pentatonic scale, A flat. Um, you know, so it's just not time to think about all of that. So I made it through. I played a lot of A flats. <laughs> 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 so um, I am still playing with them. They haven't fired me. Um, and what I can't do though, I mean, it's, it's, these chord patterns are so um, complex. I'm not there yet. So um, I tend to write out solos if I'm going to play a solo with the guys. Um, but so I'm on a quest. And so just to set the context, it was a few years ago that you joined this band. Is that right? It, it, about two years. I, I thought it was just to play, you know, in the band with my son. And that when he'd go to college that, you know, goodbye. Thank you, honey. That was good. 
Um, no, no, no. Now they got me playing everything. I play um, whatever the pianist has. And if there, if there is a flute part he can give me, he gives that to me. And um, one time they whipped out Stars and Stripes, <laughs> which was great. Um, but yeah, sight reading, that's, that's, a, that's a little interesting if you hadn't done it in a while. But that was super cool. Stars and Stripes with big bands. So that, that, that was, that was um, a highlight for me. But yeah, I'm still in there. They didn't fire me, so it's all good. <laughs> Fantastic. And you, you know, two of your three kids are still at the age where they're at home with you. You're still clearly playing that mom role, but somehow finding time for music alongside that and, you know, making great strides in what you've been working on. Tell us a little bit about that. How has music come back into your life? How does it fit into your week week routine? What kinds of things have you been working on since joining that band? Um, it, so my whole practice routine has, has completely changed. Um, since this introduction of jazz, um, I have to so much more by ear. I do a lot more listening. Um, I listened, um, you know, in the, in the classical realm, um, but the listening now is so much different, so much, in, so much more intense, because um, you're listening to reproduce. And um, I was, I, I have this, um, it, a lot's happening actually, so it's, it's a little bit hard, but um, my practice routine, is different in that um, I take things such as um, Improvise for Real has some exercises out there. And so I have to practice a lot in my car. So I, I listen a lot um, to things I'm working on or um, a solo that I'd like to transcribe. Or um, I've got a set of exercises that I purchased from um, David Reed. Um, they're called Sing the Numbers where his system is based on where you are within the tonal map. So you're singing one and three and two and four. Um, and so I listen to this lovely voice, sing the numbers, and then I get to echo it. And so part of my practice routine when I have my flute in my hands is to play that again and then play the notes. So I figured out what key it was in and then I go ahead and play the notes. So that's part of my practice routine. And another one I just picked up from, um, a gentleman named Michael Lake, he's, he's uh, Alto Bone is his website. He has something out there where he takes the Brahms lullaby and you got to figure it out. And then he gives a, a tone like, Nick, and then you have to play, like, dee, 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 dee. you have to play it. So he gives you just this tone and then you have to play the whole tune. And so I am trying to get through that. That is quite a challenge. So that, that is part of my, my listening part of my practice session. Then I created a, a warm up that I like to go through, and um, I usually base that warm up on the key of pieces I'm working on. So I've got some stuff I'm working on in B flat right now, and um, I use that as my warm up. And um, I got pulled back into classical music. We have a new accompanist at our church, and I've just gone back to play at church again to kind of get performing regularly, so that I'm not nervous. The jazz band's so nerve wracking for me because it's so new. Um, to kind of want to make performing old hat again. And um, our new accompanist is from the Northeast. He's a very high level player. Um, one, of those, one of those people that um, play by ear and they have perfect pitch. <laughs> one of those guys. Um, name the tune, he can sit down and play it. And so he's challenging me and he wants to do a recital. <laughs> he just showed up. And then I get to do this. So um, he's making me play some classical tunes, but I've pushed the envelope and we're playing stuff that's kind of half jazz, half classical. Um, and he did pick out one piece he wants to do, and it, it's, a, it, it's called um, Meditation by Massenet, common piece that, that's played by violin or flute and, or piano. And um, I approached it differently, and that's probably the biggest change in my practice routine is I know this song. Um, I played the recording and learned it from the recording. I don't look at the music. Um, I don't have it solid yet, um, but that's how I rehearsed it with him, was without the music. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I, I want to dig into some of this, if I may, because I know that for some people following along, that sounds a bit magical. <laughs> and I think some of the exercises you just described are maybe the, the kind of legwork that gets you to the point of being able to do that, to just listen to a piece and figure it out. But I wonder if you could break down what does it look like when you say you listen to that piece and without the sheet music you figured out how to play it? What what would say five minutes of doing that look like? Um, 
well, it's more than five minutes. It's jump, a lot of listening. Like, it's, it's, it's a lot of listening. I mean, the five minutes might be the part of me trying it out. Um, but it's just a ton of listening. And what I did was um, I have a, an, an app that will um, allow me to loop things. So I would just loop it. So I'm folding clothes, making dinner, and I'm looping that little section that I'm trying to learn. Um, so um, I, I will do that. And then that'll be my practice routine later on in the evening. I'll go and I'll work those few bars. So I, I broke it down to like 10 bar incre increments. And I set up a backing track so that I could play over it so I could hear the chords as I went through it because I wanted to hear um, the tension in, in the music, which is something um, that I've picked up since I've joined Musical U, is, is, is um, listening for the tension in the release in the music. Boy, that never occurred to me as a classical player. That's crazy, but it never did. And, and you guys have definitely enlightened me to that. Um, I listen differently than I used to, thanks to the, um, what was the course I took? Musician's ear. <laughs> so the Great. intense listening. But I, I knew that I needed to do that in, in pursuit of jazz anyway, um, that I, I had to up my listening. I hear my son doing it. Um, I started doing it. And I listen to players that I want to emulate. And I listen to other players. So I knew that that had to happen. So, um, but this, this looping thing, totally recommend it. This, you can you can listen intently, or you can listen listen to it in the background while you're doing something else. But if it's always there, you start to get the the, the tune in your head and be able to sing it. And then if you can sing it, you can play it. Uh, so I'm going to play the part of our prototypical audience member and say, really, is that really true? So you you mentioned they're listening for the tension and release. How much are you actively, consciously doing stuff in your head when you listen, so that later on when you pick up your flute, you have some idea what notes to play. And how much is it just passive? And then somehow when you pick up your flute, you know the right notes. It, it's mostly, <clears throat> it's mostly passive because I have kids <laughs> and they always need something. Um, but I do do the active listening when they're not around. And, and then I have to just kind of limit myself to what I'm listening to. Um, but it, it, it and, and you're right. It's not that easy. I have spent um, a, a great deal of time learning some of the principles that they, they have in the Improvise for Real book. Um, I sing those numbers. Um, I've um, spent time um, in some of the modules that you have at Musical U, um, going over the intervals, um, going over the chords, singing the chords. I actually developed um, some exercises for my kids where <clears throat> you, you find a particular tune that goes with the interval you're trying to learn. And then I played that tune in 12 keys. Because <laughs> I figure I have to, if this is what I'm supposed to do, if I'm supposed to um, learn these, this language of jazz, and, and um, I learn from Brent Bartstra at learnjazzstandards.com, I have to do it in all 12 keys. So why don't I start with something easy like two notes? <laughs> Maybe I should do two notes and try to do that interval in all 12 keys. Um, and then I'll take, what I decided to do is take maybe, um, I don't know, Descending Major Second, was it Mary Had a Little Lamb, right? Um, that's a good one to start with. <laughs> um, and that's pretty easy to do in all 12 keys once, once you've learned your key signatures. So um, I did stuff like that and kind of pushed myself that way because I really want to learn this bad. <laughs> Fantastic. And one of the things you mentioned there was David Reed's Improvise for Real and I wonder if we could just spell out a little bit more what's going on in those exercises you mentioned. So his Sing the Numbers course, it's using the scale degrees, right? So when you talk about singing the one and the three and the two and the four, we're talking about particular notes from the scale. Right. He, he, he has two levels and I, I had already done some ear training, so I bought level two so I can explain level two in detail. Um, he has the, the premise of that we have seven notes in the scale. Let's, if, if we talk about C major scale, we have C, D, E, F, G, A, and B. So he starts with that and then he says, well, he goes, you can build a chord on each of those scale tones. And he calls those the seven worlds. So the chord would be, um, let's see, on C is one, three, five, and seven. And on the two chord is two, four, six, one and et cetera. And so in this sing by numbers two, he plays the one chord. So he's playing C, E, G, and B. 
and then the singer proceeds to sing some of those scale tones. They give you three trials. Um, one seems to be like a general trial, kind of experimenting with all of the scale tones. The second one is only the chord tones. So if it's the one chord, you're only singing one, three, five, and seven, which in the key of C is C, E, G, and B. And um, she just comes up with kind of every iteration of those notes that you can come up with. And then the final one kind of expands beyond the octaves. So you could be singing the top level seven to one to two, maybe three above that. And you may go below one to seven to six. So um, I, I think it's great. My, my son and I, my middle son and I sing that on the way to school. <laughs> so I make him practice with me. Um, and, and I think this is all coming together and helping. Um, there was a, a very powerful talk that, that um, I heard uh, Brent Barstra at LearnJazzSanders.com interview um, Marshall McDonald, who was the lead alto with the Count Basie band. And he said that when he began improvising, he just sang stuff and tried to duplicate it on his instrument. And that sounded good to me. <laughs> um, and so actually yesterday when I, when I got out my horn, I'm like, you know what, let, let me just, just hum a little something and see how things are going. And I was finding the notes. My, my new progress journal says to, um, to improve my ear to instrument connection. And so that's been my main emphasis is just just cluing in this ear and it doesn't happen fast. It, it, it's, it takes time and, and it's a frustrating thing. We all get frustrated with it. Even people that are great are like, I don't hear that. I don't understand that. Um, so, uh, and I'm a little bit crazy in pursuing this. There are a ton of people this has I come listen across. to. <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you, like I, I, I can tell you just even what I listen to today. <laughs> You want to know what I heard today? <laughs> I, I'm really nuts about it. And, and I, um, I, I'm encouraged because I think I'm starting to get there. Um, and it, it's, a different, it's a different mindset. Like you, you, I know that you talk a lot about mindset. Um, this mindset of really knowing what you're going to play beforehand is huge. Whether you're just doing classical music or, or jazz improvisation, if you know it really well, your fingers tend to find it better. It, it, I wish someone would have, would have told me that years ago because the, the, the classical preparation that our pianist has asked me to do, I'm listening to that stuff like crazy. I don't have a lot of time <laughs> to practice this stuff he wants me to do. And so I decided I'm just going to listen as much as I can. And I'm having a better chance at finding my way rather than being frustrated. I can't play that. I just slow it down super slow until my ear understands it. And I'm having much more success. And, and, and that is definitely something I've noticed in my kids. I, I, I teach flute lessons as well. And um, they'll come in and they just can't get something. And I make them sing it. And if they can sing it, they turn around and they play it like that. It's nuts. So we do not use our ear as much as we should. We really don't. Not in the classical world at all. So that, that's been my big lesson through jazz. I mean, jazz has taught me to listen, listen, and listen some more. Gotcha. And before we move on, I want to ask one follow-up question that I know will have been on people's minds, which is, you were doing these kinds of ear training exercises, like the Improvise for Real course, for example, and the playing in all 12 keys, whether it's an interval or a melody. And then we also heard about how these days, if you're approaching a new piece, you might choose to skip the sheet music and just figure it out by ear. We're using a lot of listening. How much are you, and I'm asking this because the answer genuinely varies in my experience, it's not that there's a right answer and a wrong answer, different people do it different ways, but how much are you consciously applying what you learn? So are you using, say, that numbering system when you pick up your flute and you're trying to play what you heard, or is it just kind of embedded at that point and it comes out automatically? Okay, I, I think it's a combination of the two. Um, Michael Lake that I mentioned, I think he, the exercise that, that he provides, the instructions are don't think about where you are. Don't think that there, here comes the octave jump. Um, so he instructs you not to do that. Um, and, and I get that. And, and, and I think the more you emphasize on that, it becomes a little more automatic. Um, however, um, I think when you know you are, 
it gives you a little bit more of a grounding place rather than just throwing yourself out there. Yeah, let's just see if this works because then you don't know where you mess up. So if I'm trying to get through, I think it's Brahms lullaby that I'm learning. Um, at what point am I messing up? I'd have to hum the tune and like, is that the place? <laughs> I wouldn't even know. <laughs> so, um, I, but I think um, what he's trying to say is, is get the, get the left brain out of there and let the right brain do what it's supposed to do. The right brain can hear all this stuff. Um, the right brain has the feeling. Um, so I, I think that's what he's, he, he means by that. But I, I literally use a combination of the two. And it's, with the notes go by, sometimes the notes go by too quickly. You can't like even, you know, come up with the number. <laughs> so it, it's almost like it starts on three or, or that, it, that, that's four, you know, or, and, and I think all my practice in going through all 12 keys, it, it's not hard to come up with what four is, you know, and, and even in the key of B <laughs> or something like that. So um, I, I would have to say I use a combination of the two. Wonderful. And you mentioned there, you know, I wish someone had told me this way back when, or I wish I'd known that back when I was learning. What other things come into that category for you? And obviously you have the teacher's perspective now, you're consciously deciding what to give these kids in their practicing and their learning the instrument. What else falls into that category for you? I, I would have to say how to practice. I, I wish that they would have literally told me how to practice. I, I didn't know. I spent hours trying to figure out how to practice and, and, um, at one point, since I had to get back into this and my skills were pretty, pretty low, um, I had to figure out how to get back up to speed. And so um, I took my engineering mind along with my um, musical mind. I said, hey, if this is what I have to do, what's the right way to approach this? What, what is the problem here? What is it that I'm missing out or what is it that I typically don't do correctly? And um, I, I'd have to say the big thing that came to me was, um, how we play between the beats. For instance, if you're, you're playing something that's eighth notes, where does that eighth note fall? Is it falling exactly on the upbeat? And so I take my students through um, a series of exercises in which you'll take the major scale. They have a pattern that they typically play uh, for the major scale and it's an audition pattern. And so I, I'm good with that. I, I can understand that. When you play the audition, play that pattern. But if you want to get better at playing the flute or your instrument, you need to do, you need to do it differently. You know, you, you just have to keep changing it up. So my kids play um, exercise and I'll set the metronome at 40. And then I will have them click the subdivisions. I actually put some backing tracks for them where it clicks the subdivision and you're playing your major scale in eighth notes, but your, your sound, each sound you play matches with the metronome. So at 40, it's really hard to kind of figure where the upbeat is. So you just match the metronome. And then um, they're instructed to uh, change the rhythm to triplets as, as, they, as they are comfortable. And then we move to 16th notes. And then um, thank goodness for metronomes that have uh, different subdivisions like five over one. Um, that gets crazy and that makes them think. You know, if you, they'll be like, yeah, 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 I know my scales. I'm like, okay, play it this way. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And, but they're able to do it. I do this, I do this as, as a clinician at the schools too. So I have the whole group of them doing it. Um, and so we do five over the beat, six over the beat, seven over the beat. That's kind of mind blowing, but that's the whole scale. And when you get to the next beat, you start again on, on the main note. So, um, but, uh, and then you do eight over the beat. And I think there were, there were two things. The reason I did that was um, to feel what's happening between the beats so that you're exactly matching that finger exchange um, with the metronome. So you get control of your hands. And the number two reason was um, sometimes these notes just, you know, you, you have to, you're asked to play fast notes so quickly. And if I didn't touch on that, that was, that was something that was um, hard for me in that I didn't have music instruction and, and the level of music was so high that that's where I create, oh, that's right. I, I did say, I, that's where I created the smear. Um, cause I can fake it really well this way. It teaches them to play every note in between and they are so confident. And I think that was probably part of what was lacking in my confidence is that I wasn't sure if it was going to come off or not. <laughs> so, <laughs> who wants to stand on a ball and play their flute for everybody? You know, and, and I think that this technique has worked so beautifully in what my students have accomplished and um, the kids that I work with in the schools. Um, and then, you know, you stay at 40 for a long time. But if you do the math, 
um, once you get up to eight over the B, you're actually playing 16th notes at 80. That's not that fast, you know? Um, and, and then it, it kind of eases you into the fast playing. And, and um, I'm doing a lot of research into Josh Turknet's, uh, Turknet, excuse me, uh, his, his, um, his laws of brain Joe. And uh, he, so one of the things he touched on was that this fast playing just, just comes with experience. And, and I think that it may, may be feel good that this, this exercise really kind of gives them that experience. And, and you're, you're being precise about what you do every step of the way. So then it's not like deer in the headlights, like oh, 16th notes. That's what they all do in high school. They're, they're afraid of 16th notes. <laughs> but I teach them how to practice like this. And, and if I, I've got one young lady that just, she said, she said okay. She did everything I said, okay. And, and she, uh, we have a, comp, uh, not a competition, but they have a all district band that is three counties um, so it's three surrounding counties um, and all the high schools involved in those counties. And she won first chair as a sophomore. And it's, it's just that she's confident. She's, she's been able to kind of work her way through like this. And, and, she, and she took my challenge to do happy birthday in all 12 keys too. <laughs> so, she's maybe as nuts as I am. I don't know. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I, I was saying to you before we hit record that I think you're going to really enjoy the interview we have coming out with Greg Goodhart and a couple of the things you just mentioned align perfectly with what he was saying. Like, for example, often the sticking point is that the student isn't actually doing what the teacher told them to. And if they would just do what the teacher told them to, they would get a really long way. I agree. Yes. He was also pointing out that, you know, actually, if you really crack practice and you get your repertoire to a certain level of mastery, performance anxiety isn't really a thing anymore because you know you can do it and you know you can do it at speed so why would you be worried <laughs> and it's exactly it and I'm sure he mentioned that the more you do it the more confident you feel about performing that's why I went back to to play at church because I, I play Saturday and Sunday so I play every week um I guess on Sunday there's probably 800 plus people and then maybe 400 on Saturday night or something um, so you got an audience, but it's a safe audience. They can't fire me. <laughs> so it's all good. But the, with this new pianist, I get challenges. And I, I have to share this one with you too. Um, he asks, he, he switches things all the time, all the time. So my new challenge is um, when he changes key, I got to figure it out faster. <laughs> wow. he, he just randomly changes key. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to play this song. Um, I had music for the song. It's not what I knew real well. Did not know it by ear at all. Um, so there wasn't even time to even configure the numbers <laughs> for, for that. And the guitarist and I just looked at each other and we're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's my new, my new mission is, is to hear when he changes key. Hey, yeah, yeah. That, that, that gentleman. <laughs> Keeping you on your toes. That's oh my gosh. Well if I've picked up anything from this conversation, Sherilyn, and your posts inside Musical You, it's that you are someone who thrives on that challenge and you certainly don't shy away from it. I wonder, are there any other insights about practicing in particular that you wish you could go back and tell yourself or that you're now giving your students when you say you didn't know how to practice? Are there other things you're giving them? Definitely. Um, I, I think that um, they always say to work on your sound, you need to do long tones. And I've met other professional fluids that say, I don't do long tones. Um, but, you know, there, there, are, there are so many cool things out there that you can put with, let's say, long tones. So if you're working on your sound, find some um, good examples. Um, some of those are, are the drone tones. So you play, you play a drone tone and you can match that sound. Um, and what I, would ha what I have my students doing is kind of combining that with the, uh, the improvise for real mentality in that play, play the, the, the tone of the drone tone, but then go, go in the scale pattern above that. So let's say we're, it, it's a drone tone on C, then play D against that. How does that sound? How do you feel about that? Do you like that? Then, then you go back, you're getting a sense of where you are in the scale. And if you're playing, let's say C, D to C, then you've just, you've just, um, giving yourself a great example of what a major second is. So you can begin to get these, these intervals in your ears and you go C to E 
back to C very slowly. C to F, back to C, C to G, back to C, C to A, back to C, and C to B, back to C, and then do the octave. Check your intonation on the octave. That's a good way to do long tones, is that type of thing. And the other thing is, is um, they have sine waves out there, like pure sine tones. Um, I've been doing a little bit of that, and that's great for intonation. So that would have been a really cool one because I, I, you know, I think you get bored. You're like, okay, mm, what am I supposed to be doing? I'm holding this long note. You, you can do, you know, it, typically you, you'll do like a, um, a, a loud, soft kind of thing. How soft can you play? Can you make it grow louder? And can you make it grow softer and still maintain the pitch? But um, I, I kind of dig in that, that the, the, the sine wave thing. That's pretty cool, the, the, the sine tones. Um, and there are apps out there that are free that you can kind of put those on. And I think those are super cool. And again, jazzers, jazzers are into this kind of stuff. And, and I, I think that's super neat. So get out those long tones because the most important thing you do is, is have a good sound. And I've, I've heard players just run up and down their horns and I just can't get past their sounds if, if they don't have a good sound. And, and the average listener is really pretty much the same way. You could win them on that first note. And uh, so sound is, is really something that's super important to work on. And, and those are fun exercises to do. And they're challenging, um, especially if you start trying to push the limits of how soft can I play it? How loud can I play it? Because those are all things that we're challenged to do in our ensembles or in our solo playing. Awesome. And I know that our audience are going to be annoyed with me if I let you go without asking for all of the resources and things you found useful along the way. We've already mentioned David Reed at Improvise for Real and Brent over at Learn Jazz Standards. Oh, there we go, the book. Perfect. And I think Michael Lake was the other one who had the Brahms lullaby. Is that right? Yes. He has, he has more exercises out there that build you up to that because that, that's pretty challenging. Um, and, and, and I'm going to probably get more with him on that. Um, but he does have build up exercises. It looks like it's based on intervals. So, um, he's definitely worth a look. Um, I've also gotten into, um, and it, they no longer have a website, but they have YouTube videos, learn jazz faster. There's a couple of guys from Berkeley. Um, and I've bought their eBooks when they were still, um, when they saw their website, one of the gentlemen had a baby <laughs> and then, that was it. You know, he's like, I, I, I'm, I'm right. all in for this kid. So yes, I can sympathize. Uh, yeah. It, yes, I can too. So, um, but those guys have some really great stuff, but the YouTube videos are out there. They're free. Um, they have something called, I think it's 25 great ways to something about your practice. Um, and then um, I tune into Amy Nolte. I think she's great. Um, she's got all kinds of stuff. She, she does all kinds of things. Um, I'm trying to think of who else that, that I've done. I, I did purchase Jeffrey's book, Jeffrey a Grill. Oh yeah, fantastic. This one. Improvisation now it's time games to play. for classical musicians. Yes, that's have what done, I'm... Have you dove, dive not dove yet. into it yet? No. Not yet, that pianist kind of threw me off course. He just, he just showed up about two, two months ago. <laughs> so, yeah, there's your improvisation games right there. Well, I know. <laughs> church. Well, I know. It. Um, but that, those, that's pretty much what I'm into now. Um, those things. And I think um, I would probably look up Michael Lake and, and maybe get a Skype lesson with him. Because um, he seems to be, I, I, I have to interject with this, that a lot of times with the approach with jazz is, here's the chord, use the chord tones, use the chord scale, use this. And I, I struggle with that as a musician going, how's that improvisation? How am I really expressing myself if I know this is what I always play when I get there? Um, they've, um, I guess in my further research, they've expanded beyond that in that let's say you found a piece of jazz language or a lick that you liked, um, they tell you to make variations of that. And so that, that, then that brings in your expression. But if you're sitting there counting the measures until that lick shows up that you practice, <laughs> um, I, I, I can't see how that's improvisation. So I have struggled with that for two years and, and Michael seems to be the, not the first one. I, I'd have to say through Musical You, that was the first. Uh, and um, Andrew's play, listen, listen, play. Yeah, I, I, so part of my list needs to be musical you and, and, and your, in, in your improv module because that, that, that's, been, that's been super cool. And he puts just great backing tracks up there that, that make you just want to play free and, and, and figure it all out. Uh, so that, that's brilliant. Um, but I, I think Michael Lake, I think he's got something there. So I'm, I'm going to look into him some more. That's probably where I'm headed. 
um, because it's all in this hearing. And um, one thing I did learn from Josh Turknet there in, in my research of him, he says that once you've um, made something automatic, or I, I would say internalized, um, that you need to let it go. Because when the left brain steps in, that's a bad thing. <laughs> it, it'll mess you up. So I kind of see that for jazz. So if you're thinking, oh, here comes that two, five, one, I want to use that lick um, that I learned, then your left brain just stepped in. And so I'm kind of curious about what he has to say, because he's pretty much saying, no, no, let that right brain take over and, and just make that connection between the ear and your instrument tight. So um, I, I, I think it comes, I, I am failing at that exercise. I've been, I've been working on it only just a week, but uh, I, I fail at it. So that ought to be a really interesting lesson. <laughs> 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 I think he expects it. Um, but yeah, the, so he's just got to keep at it. And, and, and I see these jazzers. I, I talk to these guys that play in the band that I play in. One is actually um, a professor at a community college. Same one I used to teach at. Um, and he, he shakes his head sometimes and he says, oh man, I, I just heard something today and I just don't understand it. So I, that's what I like about jazzers. I, I think they feel like they, they're always working. They're always learning. And you know, I've met some classical people that maybe think they've arrived. <laughs> so not all of them, but um, I, I tend to say I, I probably identify more with these jazzers that are always wanting to learn and always wanting to get better. Tremendous. Well, thank you so much, Sherilyn. I, I know I'm not alone in consider my, considering myself very lucky that I get to follow along with your progress journal inside Musical You, because you're always, as is clear from this conversation, up to some really interesting stuff and pushing the boundaries for yourself. And it's honestly very inspiring. So thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me. I've, I've had a great time. Oh, hey, one more thing. If you enjoyed this video, please take a second to like it on YouTube, and if you haven't already, please also subscribe to our channel there. That's going to help make sure you get all our latest videos as soon as they come out, and it also helps us reach more people, which means more episodes, better guests, and everybody wins. So please take a second to like this video and hit subscribe.